Hi. Hello, everybody. Welcome to MHTV. We're really pleased to have you with us here tonight. Um, my name is Nikki Lambert. Um, we have a fantastic guest here from Rethink, uh, Lucy. So before we hand over and get stuck into talking about all things Rethink, let me hand you over to Vanessa and she'll tell you how you can join in with us tonight. Vanessa? Hello, everybody. Um, welcome tonight. We're really excited tonight to have Lucy mm -hmm. here from Rethink. As Nikki says, Lucy will introduce herself in a minute. Um, I sit on the clinical advisory group for Rethink, so I know what brilliant work they do, particularly around, um, you know, supporting people with more severe end of mental illness that, you know, gets less talked about in mainstream media. So I think it's a really important conversation that we're having tonight. If you want to join in, you can join in on Twitter. Just follow the MHTV hashtag. You on Facebook. If you're going on Facebook, go over to the Unite MHNA Facebook page and you should see the live Twitter, the live feed there. You can add comments and you can watch the live stream as we go along. I've got a bit of an iffy um, signal tonight, so I may dip in and out, but um, I'll be um, following and, and talking on Twitter throughout the conversation. Thank you. And I'll Fantastic. pass you over to Lucy to introduce Absolutely, Lucy. Hello, hi, I'm Lucy. I'm the Associate Director for Policy and Practice at Rethink Mental Illness. Um, Rethink is a national charity and we, we provide services for people severely affected by mental illness all around the country. Mm. Um, we run groups and that's really where our charity was founded um, with some carers groups set up and then growing from mm. there, really reflecting the need there was for people to be able to talk to other people who were going through similar issues. Mm. Um, and all of that feeds into our campaigning and our lobbying. And that's the team that I, I kind of oversee, which is around understanding the issues that people severely affected by mental illness are facing, um, co-producing with people with lived experience, but also with clinicians and, and people like Vanessa, who sits on our clinical advisory group, as she said, um, co-producing solutions to these problems. And then trying to lobby to make sure that they're turned into policy, but then crucially that they're actually delivered in practice for people. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, really excited to be here tonight. Some of our, our main issues at the moment are really around how the pandemic is currently affecting yeah. people severely uh, living with severe mental illness and their carers, um, how it's affecting their mental health, how it's affecting their access to services, but also how it's affecting their physical health as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, really so we can start with that then. <clears throat> let's, let's open with that because that's, that's really current, isn't it? It's important for us to understand that better, particularly as I think a lot of the kind of impact of COVID has been based around kind of people experiencing sleeplessness, anxiety, sadness, which is not mental illness. That's human experience. So I think it's really important for us to get stuck into that. Tell us tell us a little bit about how um, how people with severe mental health issues have been impacted. Yeah, definitely. So we we did a survey of over 1,400 people last year. Um, that was just after the first lockdown, trying to understand people's experience. Um, and we were really careful to make sure that we focused on people with pre-existing mental illness. So mm -hmm. things like schizophrenia, psychosis, personality mm -hmm. disorders, and kind of complex mental illness as well. Um, we didn't just do it by diagnosis, but also by certain symptoms that people are facing. So we know not everyone kind of identifies with a mental illness diagnosis or don't necessarily have one. So um, the, the responses that we got really showed a huge impact on people. So we found that 79% of people who responded, um, so these 1,400 people, said that their mental health had got worse because of that first lockdown. Um, and we can only imagine, we're doing another survey now, but we can only imagine that that's going to have got worse after a year of the pandemic. Um, so many reasons for that. And I think it's really complex and everyone's facing different experiences, but there were kind of common themes that came out around people struggling to access services, um, not necessarily feeling like they their, their access to care was the same as before. So maybe their their key contact or their clinician or their psychiatrist or their nurse social worker had changed or had been redeployed somewhere or maybe um, it had all gone remote whereas they were used to having face-to-face -face contact and they didn't really feel like a, you know a phone appointment or a, a zoom appointment was really going to work for them um not not zoom probably more like teams but you know what i mean yeah. um yeah. 
And then just people's everyday kind of coping mechanisms being taken away from them. So that access to peer support, access to, you know, going outside and being able to do what you want when you want to be able to manage your mental health and your mental illness um, in so many cases has, has just been taken away and people have really quickly had to try and find alternatives to those coping mechanisms, which mm. hasn't been possible for everyone. So mm. um, it's been a huge impact. And I think we're seeing that in terms of demand now and we're hearing from um, from clinicians that there is that increasing demand, yeah, but also that there are people with maybe more common and mild mental health problems. This is triggering more serious and more severe mental illness as well mm. so <clears throat> yeah I think a huge impact mm. so that's such a lot of disruption I think throughout the whole system but you did mention as well physical health uh, people's physical health being impacted in what way is that happening yeah. so um again this survey that we did we found that people were less likely to be exercising more likely to be eating more unhealthy and mm. then increasing their intake of, of alcohol and, and drugs mm. so again those you know the, the kind of lifestyle factors that we know um, impact all of us mm. people who we spoke to with mental illness you know we couldn't do a comparison with the rest of the population but it is concerning that that people were feeling like yeah they were they were less like less able to do exercise less mm. likely to be eating unhealthy mm. this is against that backdrop of people with severe mental illness are more likely to die 15 to 20 yeah. earlier than the rest of the population yeah. anyway because of medication and, and these lifestyle factors and, and and there being real inequalities in how people mm. with severe mental illness are treated for their physical yeah. health and not just their mental health and that kind of gap in support in so many cases. Mm. Um, there are there are a huge number of sort of national policies to try and address this, which is so important. But in many cases, they're not kind of being implemented in practice. Or COVID meant that they were stopped or paused. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking particularly of the um, the annual physical health check that yeah. people with severe mental illness are entitled to, and there is a target for 60% of all people with severe mental illness to get that. And at the moment, only, I think, 23% yeah, of people cool. have been getting it. So mm -hmm. that's really the, you know, the kind of entry point to, for people to be able to get support that they need from the NHS. Mm -hmm. And that's not happening. So yeah, <laughs> at, at the same time, as people sort of struggling to address mm -hmm. their lifestyle. In a way, it's weird because COVID is almost like shining a light on a lot of the problems we have, not just societally, but actually in terms of services as well. It's been really... Um, Clarifying experience, should we politely say. And you did notice as well that we've got this increased demand. So you, you're thinking maybe community mental health transformation might be might be a different way of approaching or finding solutions. Could you tell us a little bit about what that is? Because we are um, we have got the report being retweeted out. So if people want to have a quick look at that, that will really help as well. Definitely, yeah. So at Rethink, um, our vision is essentially to build what we call a community communities that care so mm. recognizing that people with severe mental illness they they need clinical support they need support from nurses and psychiatrists mm -hmm. but if someone is facing money problems lack of you know it, unable to get a job um unstable housing yes. social isolation then you can have as much therapy talking therapy dbt whatever it is as you want but that's not that's not really going to support someone to recover or, or have a good quality of life if they've got a mental illness if these mm. other societal factors aren't aren't mm. there so we our report building communities that care sets out this kind of vision for making sure that all of these different factors are are um provided for in communities mm. um and we were really really pleased again that the kind of national policy is there the, there is this community mental health framework that NHS England published um, last year and they are putting a huge amount of money into the NHS um, nearly a billion pounds for the next mm. three years every year for the next three years to realize that vision so to make sure that community mental health um, it has that funding to transform and to make sure that it's expanded so people yeah. do have more access to clinical services and clinical therapies but also that a significant part of that money goes to 
things like the voluntary sector to provide peer support and um, employment support, IPS services, and um, all of these wider uh, support mechanisms and interventions so that people don't do have that, that support as close to home as possible. Mm. Whereas at the moment, people tell us all the time um, that they are essentially told by their GP if they present with any kind of mental health problem, they're told, well, you're, you're too unwell, you're too mentally unwell for IAPT, which is what's available locally, but mm. you're not unwell enough for, um, for a psychiatrist or for inpatient care. So sorry, mm. there's nothing available for you at the moment. Mm. Mm. And uh, that is really ridiculous. We've talked about this before, I think, on, on Mental Health TV, about this, the ridiculousness of supposedly providing a service for people that's not a service that actually helps people. It's like you don't tell people they don't fit in a box. If someone yeah. comes to you with a problem, then you fix you fix your service to service the need. Exactly. You know, it's very much kind of um, back to front. It's a very odd, odd experience. And I, I can't imagine how people respond politely being told that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, we hear it all the time. We have a helpline at Rethink Mental Illness and, and people are calling the helpline all the time saying that they there's no support available for them locally. Um, mm. They don't know who to turn to. Mm. And it's only really if they're in crisis that, that mm. they then get that support. And and that's yeah. too late then for a lot of people. And yeah, yeah that, that's just yeah. unsustainable. Mm. And the other thing I've, I've noticed, I'm sure you, you, you've been experiencing this as well, because a, a lot of us have all got ties to voluntary sector and, and third sector uh, uh, organisations, is how tough it is at the moment and how many people are having to suspend services or don't have the infrastructure to manage or certainly have lost huge swathes of funding. And we are really seeing that as an impact. So is it possible, do you think, to make this transformation during the crisis? Because on one hand, you know, COVID, you know, brought lots of people together in some ways. You know, people have joined like local neighbourhood WhatsApp groups, a lot of groups have organised and that's been really positive. Um, but on the other hand, we've seen these stresses as well. So what's, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think where where we as an organisation are seeing the big crunch point is, is with local authority funding. Mm. Um, so it's just very strange and contradictory that from April, there's going to be mm. this nearly a billion pounds worth of funding going into the NHS to transform mm. community mental health. At the same time, as we as the voluntary sector are seeing significant cuts from local authorities yeah. into mental health provision and mental health provision, um, we're you know hearing anecdotally around the country. Um, we're experiencing that as an organisation ourselves as well local authority provision is being kind of rolled back to the bare bones that it possibly can because of mm. social care budgets mm. and and you cannot as i said before you know you cannot provide a, a sustainable community mental health model mm. just investing in the community in the clinical side of things it has to be the wider social care element as well mm. and i think the nhs recognizes that completely mm. because they are putting this money in and, and saying that that the funding has to go to the voluntary sector but this is where we need the government to make that commitment to the lo to local authorities and to really, you know, set out the plan and the strategy for what is going to happen with local authorities and social care. And make sure mm. that that's not just focused on older adults, but mm. mental health and working age adults as well. Mm. And because so often the social care conversation gets lost in discussions yeah. about care homes and so on. Yeah, who are also in no, no uh, joyful position right now as well. So I think we all... And we can see that. So how, how is it, do you think, that maybe the NHS could do something? Because we've got lots of people who watch, who are, you know, working in services. What can the NHS do in terms of reaching out, making links to social care or voluntary sector? What can we do with that? Yeah, so now, now we are seeing around the country that um, there is almost like a period of co-production happening. So NHS England has set the, um, the kind of expectation that community mental health uh, care needs to be transformed. The, mo the money is coming in from April, but there's going to be this period and there should be this period of co-production happening where the NHS should be leading, but reaching yeah. out and working with local authorities, voluntary sector and people with lived experience mm -hmm. to co-produce what their very local community mental health model should look like. Because obviously mm -hmm. there will be kind of national expectations, but it has to be local to actually work for local populations because mm. you know, the population of Harrow in London mm. is going to have a very different population, different needs, different expectations from the very rural area of Somerset, for example. So 
Yeah, very much. Yeah, just really urging. Um, and it, I think it's all about kind of finding local uh, NHS people who are passionate about this and want to get involved in the transformation, putting mm. their hand up and talking to uh, to their sort of transformation leads to get involved. Mm-hmm. And then and then part of that being about just reaching out and speaking to local voluntary organisations um, and the local authority to to try and bring people together and work together to design what this new model could look like. Mm. I've got a couple of, of questions come through from students, actually. Um, so one of the students was asking about um, how do you influence government? <laughs> Starting off with a small question, then, <laughs> raise yourself. <laughs> If we, if we only have that. I love it. Yeah. How do you influence government? Because like, I think that's a really good good point, isn't it? Because you know, there's lots of people trying to find their voice at the minute and there's lots of things that need to be challenged. Um, and then we've got another student who's asking about, it's a long email, a long email, long um, message, but what it's basically saying is, um, would you, would we, would I be welcome as a, as a, as a mental health nurse, as a third year mental health student nurse, um, if, if, if we think it's all about service users? So have you got anything yeah. for those two? So first of all, about influencing and then about, I think, participating. But I think maybe there's an anxiety about overwhelming as well, getting, getting too involved. Or yeah, it not so, being your place, I think. Yeah, actually answering that that second question, hmm. um, I, 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 it's probably quite quick in saying it's everyone's place. I think mental health and mental illness has been so underserved and under-talked about for so long. Mm. And and where we're seeing the change happening is where there are people probably traditionally thinking they would have been overstepping, but actually just really passionate and wanting to make a difference and wanting to put their hand up and get involved. That's mm. where we're seeing that change happening much quicker than in other areas, because um, it, it is all about people who are passionate kind of coming together and making this transformation happen. So. I I would say, you know, we work with people with lived experience, but we do that alongside working with clinicians. Mm. Um, We're actually, hopefully, as an organisation soon, going to be working with a couple of students as well um, Mm. and and getting, you know, having that as that's useful for us because we get some amazing clinical advice, but hopefully it's useful for them as well to see the charity side of things. So Mm. I would definitely say that there's nothing overstepping about that. And I think it's really important to get involved if you're interested Mm. Um, there's a nice question though thank you for being thoughtful about that that's a that, thank you for that question definitely um on the, you with the how do we influence government yeah <laughs> <laughs> this is i mean i yeah so i've worked in policy and campaigning for mm. about 12 years now and I, I i just find it so fascinating it's it's endlessly kind of thinking tactically and strategically and mm. trying to work out what what the best way of getting the change is and working mm. back from there. So what is the change you're trying to achieve? Working backwards from there and, and having like a range of tactics at your disposal. Some of those might be behind the scenes. A lot of what we do um, mm. is behind the scenes and it's trying to find who the key people are who have that decision making power, whether it's the Secretary of State or whether it's a minister or more mm. often than not whether it's an official or a civil servant um, mm. at the Department of Health for example and yeah. trying to you know give them the evidence really demonstrate the need show what would happen if if what you're trying to change doesn't happen and making the case so that they can't say no if and mm. when that doesn't happen which sometimes you know quite a lot at the moment that does uh, mm. Then it's about then the public side of it. So the campaigning, mm. the using social media, um, placard waving and, you know, protests and so on. Mm. But that that's quite grassroots and that that mm. works most effectively, I think, when it's students and, and people with lived experience and happening organically and naturally, people kind of coming mm. together and picking up on issues, you know, the Marcus Rad- Rashford effect mm. and, and, and campaigning. Um, mm. rather than it being organised from an organisation, you know mm. what I mean? Yeah, and I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because when you, you mentioned the Marcus Rashford, when everything aligns, when policy has gone in a wrong direction, everybody says so, you can actually recalibrate quite quickly. I think the Definitely. difficulty comes is when you've got long, long-term long issues that have complicated solutions. Absolutely. And that's when I think it's a little bit of a harder 
message, isn't it? Because it's too, it's like people duck complexity sometimes. Cause it Absolutely, feels a bit... like social care. <laughs> it's a complex yeah. issue with, without an easy answer. It's mm. not like no one agree, doesn't agree that this is a huge problem, but, mm. and there's, there is a lot of campaigning going on about it, but mm. it's still <laughs> rumbling on with no, mm -hmm. no solution. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I think as soon as you start to get to that intersection between personal and public, and health and sort of society all of a sudden it's very swampy because in, in many ways we've got the things around sort of public mental health and that's been great you know we had sort of so i had started with things like time to change um you suddenly saw people talking about it but they were talking about specific types of illness like the acceptable end so i've been sad i understand depression you're like mm. exactly. I love your impulse, but I don't think you're right. <laughs> but then when it comes to somebody who's very psychotic, they're still getting very poorly served. Definitely. Regardless of the cause for that. Yeah, there's, there's, there's the disparity of esteem between physical health and mental health. Yeah. But then even within mental health, there's a lack of sort of parity between between mm. the mental health issues. And mm. as you say that the the stigma is 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 so prevalent still for people with severe mental illness and they talk to us all the time about how they don't just face that in everyday life and kind of the media but also amongst friends and family you know particularly in certain cultures not wanting to talk about it mm. but also within the health service as well and people feeling like their personality disorder that they've been diagnosed with just isn't understood by the health professionals that they're talking to mm. um, and that that shared decision making over their care just isn't there um, mm. And I just think that's probably one of the most powerful things that's happened, just that listening. Mm. I have type 1 diabetes, and mm. that is a complex condition yeah. that I, you know, talk live with every day. The most frustrating thing that I ever come across is when a health professional tells me what to do rather than listens to how I manage my condition every day. And I just mm. think about that all the time, that that's even more frustrating for people with complex mental mm. illness and different diagnoses and without mm. that, you know, the research behind it as well so yeah absolutely i've got a couple more things coming in um this is not particularly a question but it's an interesting point so thank you steve saying um the idea of returning back to normal um as many individuals appear to long for um would would result in this spotlight you know it's about the spotlight of covid on things being turned out uh, but if we embrace change we might be able to um, redress inequality so have you, in terms of your work with Rethink, actually made any kind of statements or comments about kind of some of the inequalities that people are facing? I mean, clearly you've done that in terms of health access. I think, yeah, that that's there's something in terms of health access. Um, there's also the opportunity that we've got at the moment to influence the Mental Health Act, um, which is a really important thing that I would... There's a white paper out at the moment, which is basically the government consulting on what people think about the Mental Health Act, which essentially is just outdated legislation that's not fit for purpose to support people with mental illness it's not even just a little bit outdated yeah it's six decades decades out of date yeah um and there the so there's a few kind of again talking about influencing there's a few levers that we're trying to pull to make the change so there's again the community mental health transformation the mental health act but so often what has happened in the past is that and coming out of covid as as the listeners talked about, so often when when we do these consultations and we try and design what or we develop policy or try and influence change, we just work from the position of the people who are coming to us and telling us what they think. So the people who are kind of shouting the loudest, rather than going out and actually speaking to people who who are underserved, who are you mm. know have experience of poverty. Um, mm. racism, discrimination, you know, people from different communities, people who don't speak English as their first language. Mm. And so then the whole system gets designed around the people who are coming to us. So from, yeah. you know, a, a lot of charities perspectives, that's a lot of the time sort of 80% white women. Mm. Um, and that's, that's then creating systems for those groups of people and not for people who are yeah. underserved. So that's where we, I think, as a voluntary sector, as the government, everything that we're doing is to try and ensure that now you're addressing inequalities at the very beginning from the start mm. yeah. um, and representing what people need from the very beginning rather than mm. just going, oh, we'll do something first, take a few steps, and then we'll work out how we try and um, get you know people from 
that that community in you know that Bangladesh you need some involved and and then we'll work it out it's no not from the position of addressing inequalities first mm -hmm. absolutely I wonder if uh, Vanessa wants to come in now if she doesn't I, I've got some questions so qualified so I'll carry on <laughs> Oh, yeah, we are looking at you. <laughs> so there's a, a comment from Alfonso. So hello, Alfonso, saying, what would you recommend we can do to change the public's perception of mental health and illness? So that's a really about. good question. And that's yeah. what we, as we as Rethink and Mind, mm. work together on Time to Change. So the mm. anti-stigma campaign for so many years mm. on. And I think the huge progress that that made, um, Nikki, as you said, yeah predominantly for certain groups of people but mm. that was all around talking um mm. all around yeah kind of breaking down the barriers by talking and um feeling people enabling people to feel like they could talk about their mental health condition and as a byproduct mm. more people talk about it you know it, it talked about more in the mainstream and so on I think mm. there definitely is something about that with severe mental illness as well mm. um and and talking about it and getting people to to understand I think there's uh, the, the thing that I think is most powerful is just co-production and yes. working with people with lived experience. So not making any decisions about a service or a policy within a service or um, even, you know, any kind of communication within a service without working with your service users to design mm -hmm. that because they are the people, you know, this is all about trying to make sure that people get the care and support that they need and they kind of move to recovery as and when they can and health professionals cannot do that by themselves they can't possibly know mm. what what that solution is without working with people mm. so yeah we we say co-production is just the most powerful thing you can do and just talking and listening right. to people yeah what i really like as well is everything you say just makes perfect sense it must be so frustrating just keep repeating it when you know that it's really sensible advice <laughs> we just rule the world so that'd be <laughs> Um, there's a question here from Ben Glass. Um, it's quite a long one, but stick with it. Uh, this year marks the 10th anniversary of the Winterbourne View scandals. Horrendous. Um, so thousands of people locked away uh, for decades in this modern day um, asylum. Um, what do you think of the human rights and, and um, mental well-being of people in institutional settings that are so rarely mentioned by mental health campaign groups? And what are we think doing to challenge this? That is a really good question. Yeah. We do you, a lot of work. So we, as an organisation, uh, have we do a lot of work with people in secure care. Um, so we run a, a programme called Recovery and Outcomes, which is working with people in secure care to mm. um, enable to sort of facilitate them to be part of decision making within secure care services. Mm. And so again, it's that co-production and working with people. So we we do that very much from the inside. Um, mm. I think there's a lot more that we could all do in terms of publicly talking about it. I know the CQC have it as one of their top priorities at the moment. And um, so mm. they published a report beginning of this year, I think, called around restraint and segregation and yeah. um, the, the practice it, poor practices and just not being fit for purpose and wanting to take a much stronger view and line on, on addressing that rather than just doing a report saying it's wrong and then it not really needs to change. Mm. Um, and, and we sort of fully support them on that. But mm. there's a lot that we're doing behind the scenes. But I think you're right. But like so, it's, it's appalling <laughs> and it needs to be talked about more by everyone. And um, mm. that's something I think I'm going to take back to the organisation and, and, mm. and have, have a bit more of a think about. Mm. It does feel like there's, there's battles raging on a number of fronts at the moment, doesn't it? And it oh, can wow. be hard, I think, to, to give with limited time, energy and focus to be Prioritize. able to do, yeah, to figure out where to go first. Mm. One of the things you were talking about was um, sort of like making sure that we come from a position of looking at inequalities rather than looking at the cues for services. Is there anything that you wanted to add to that? Because, I mean, we've got issues around social care funding and all sorts of things that feed into mm. it, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so... On, on particularly on the community mental health side of things, there, there is something that we sort of a practical example, really, that which is what we're starting to do, mm. which is that we're working in a few areas uh, around the country who are starting to co-produce and, and design their community mental health 
Um, so one of my colleagues at, at Rethink, Will, has really sort of pioneered this and, and led this. And in one particular area, we're testing out how, how to start by doing this kind of community engagement and community yeah. listening yeah. Um, and, and recruiting people and working with people who have those local connections to then do that, listen to, to what people who aren't currently in the queues for services not because they don't need it, but because they don't, they're just not, not, in, not involved, you know, not aware yeah. of what's, what's available to them mm -hmm. um, and excluded. And then co-producing with these people, how mm -hmm. services should look to them um, mm -hmm. that would enable them to, to get involved. And the thing with co-production is that the, the, the sort of end model that comes out of it, you would mm -hmm. never have thought of at the beginning. So I can't yeah, sit here definitely. and say the result of it is going to be that we're going to have, you know, 10 languages and, and we're mm -hmm. going to make sure that we've got, you know, recruiting certain staff or whatever, because that that's just jumping the gun and, and just mm -hmm. second guessing yeah. what that process will look like. But isn't it amazing when you actually give power to people, if we were starting over again and designing services which support people with mental health problems, they would just look completely different. They wouldn't look anything like this. Absolutely. When I, when I was a baby nurse, it was a long time ago, um, I met a service user who I only saw them for about an hour, but they completely changed my practice. I was sat in a ward round. And this guy came in and he sat down opposite. He's, he's a consultant who I don't think he'd met before. And he basically just got out this like list. And he said, um, I've worked out how much you earn. And I've worked out how much an hour of your time is worth. And I don't think it's the best use of the money for me to sit here and mm -hmm. listen to you. So here's a list of the things I would like to have spent spend the money on instead. So if you can just give me the cash and then just not see me. Um, wow. and I was just like this, this guy's a hero. <laughs> <laughs> just the look on this consultant's face, it was just beautiful. It was like amazing. It involved <laughs> things like haircut, getting a dog. <laughs> it was just fantastic. Yeah. Like a personal budget, which some people do have. Yeah. And, um, Honestly, he was ahead of his yeah, time. Yeah, visionary. <laughs> Absolutely visionary. So did you want to come in on any of this, Vanessa? Because I appreciate sure we've been talking without you there a little bit. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I've just had um, a bad signal, but I've been um, I've been tweeting a lot tonight. So hopefully if yeah. people aren't following the conversation on Facebook, they can follow it. I think um, what Lucy is saying, which has come across really strongly for me, is all the work that we think do around um, the whole inequality issue, which, as people know, I'm particularly passionate about because I think that it's often left out of mainstream conversation, isn't it? And we focus much more on people who've maybe got milder and mental health difficulties who can get better and go back to their um, middle-class jobs, um, you know, in the middle-class houses. And that's not to put down people who experience um, yeah. sort of milder end of mental health because obviously... It does affect us all, as we know, but we do need to be talking more about people with um, more severe mental health difficulties and the impact on their lives. And And I think it was mentioned, wasn't it, earlier about digital, um, you know, the, the impact of people not being able to have face-to-face -face contact. I think, you know, that's massive, isn't it? Because a lot of the, you know, we're all talking about, um, you know, Zoom fatigue and and yet, if you've got, you know, serious mental health difficulties or issues about kind of talking over a screen mm -hmm. or you don't have the money yeah. to be able to buy technology, then, um, you know, the impact's much greater, isn't it? Or your home isn't a safe place to be able to have that phone call because yeah. people who are affecting your mental illness are just in the other room. And, and yeah. You're yeah. practitioner about that. Yeah, I'm wondering as, as well about young people. Um, mm -hmm. I'm certainly say this as a parent myself and knowing how much, you know, my children have, have struggled at times and the difficulties of going back to school and, and so on. Is, um, is Rethink doing any work around um, young people? I think I, think I hopefully got the answer to that. that. <laughs> no, yeah, so any, any work around young mm -hmm. people? Yes. Yeah, we, we, so we're... we're we do a number of projects and programs with young people. So one of our uh, pieces of work at the moment is called Step Up and it's a funded piece of work. Um, and it's all about co-producing with young people and also people, young adults in, in universities, uh, what sort of resources and tools and training they might need um, to, then, to then reach out and, and give people you know, the support that they need. And at the moment that is very focused on, on the pandemic, particularly, you know, 
students mm. at university at the moment it's all about what tools and uh, yeah. support people can get to then support their peers um, mm. who are facing mental health problems um, and and again that that has a real kind of as an organization I have to say you know traditionally we've not no we are not absolutely in any way the best at, at supporting people from different backgrounds you know particularly people from black and Asian minority uh, and ethnic minority communities but this is something that is a, a number one priority for us going for you know from and yeah. it has been for the last year and it's, it's a core part of our corporate strategy that's going to be uh, published soon as well mm. um, but there are there are pockets that I think we we can speak from really good experience on and really really proud of our step up team who who do a lot co-producing with people from different backgrounds young people and young adults and understanding what particular issues for example young black men are facing <clears throat> and then co-producing what tools yeah. they particularly need um mm -hmm. so that yeah and and what we try and do which is what my team is all about is about understanding what those lessons and you know the kind of evaluations of these projects and then mm -hmm. feeding them into our influencing and mm. speaking with kind of expertise and experience of what works and what doesn't work to then make sure that that can be rolled out around the country. Mm. Yeah, that's brilliant. It's exciting work. Mm. Really For anyone who hasn't been on the Rethink website, having a good old nose through those resources, please, please, we urge you to do it. It's mm. some really brilliant, brilliant, helpful stuff there. And particularly, mm. I think, the stuff for students was very timely indeed. Definitely. Yeah, I've got another question here, and it's from Dave. So, um, Thinking about mm. is there something um, uh, about the mental health act that we think think we should be putting in our response? So if we were to look at the the review of that, what could we do, or what could we be coming together to reinforce as a message? Great question. Good I think question. A, the the mental health act has uh, there was a review of the an independent review of the mental health act by the, uh, Simon Wesley, which mm. I think was published a couple of years ago now, so yeah. quite a while ago. Um, but there were a huge number of recommendations in there. And now in the Mental Health Act white paper, I think there's about 30 questions that the government are asking. So it's it's extensive, you know, it's a huge piece of work. And, and I think where people have particular issues and concerns, there's, there's a whole range of opportunities to feed that in. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the kind of core aspect that we are trying to change is around mm -hmm. that, um, that ability to make decisions and have more control, you know, more control and, and the rights to be able to make decisions over your care. Mm. And mm. to particularly address the racial inequalities that we see. Um, mm. So again, you know, there being a much higher proportion of black men being detained under the Mental Health Act yeah. than, than yes. white people. Mm. Um, so what, what we're really pushing for are things like uh, strengthening advanced decisions and the ability for people to make advanced decisions about their care, mm -hmm. um, strengthening the ability for people to have a kind of nominated person that can support if, if someone doesn't have the mental capacity, then uh, <clears throat> a care or a family or friend can be that nominated person. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, just really strengthening those rights because it's hugely outdated from a time where people thought if you had a mental illness, you don't have mental capacity, so mm -hmm. you can't make a decision mm -hmm. about your care. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I can't believe we've uh, our 40 minutes has gone so fast. It's just whipped mm, by. <laughs> so I guess we need to start thinking about if there's anything that um, we haven't had a chance to talk about that you particularly wanted to, to mention. Or if you've got any last, sort of like last ideas or anything that anyone particularly wants to circle back to. Vanessa, think, have you got anything? Yeah, I think, um, I think as you say, you know, we've covered a lot in a short time and we'll share um, the report that we've talked about and some of the other resources. And then if people have any more questions as well, as I mentioned, that I've got um, linked into Rethink through the clinical advisory group. So that'd be a way of, of feeding back anything we've missed. But I think it's been, you know, for 40 minutes, we've covered a lot, haven't we? And certainly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's an important conversation and, and it's brought up other issues that are maybe that we need to to look at on the program so like mm -hmm. I was thinking about then what Lucy was saying about you know students at university because there's obviously a lot of focus on on young people at school but less focus mm -hmm. on you know that sort of 18 to 25 so, mm -hmm. so that that's one area in the sort of role of universities as well I say this as a full-time student as well at the moment myself um, so mm -hmm. it's given me an interesting insight going back um, so yeah, I think 
yeah, I think we've covered a lot and it's been really helpful having Lucy on tonight and thank mm-hmm. you and um, we'll continue the conversation, won't we? Mm, absolutely. Lucy, what would you what would you like to, to end with as, as something you can leave the people who are watching with? Yeah, I think it's been so interesting and definitely food for thought for me and, and I think our organisation as well and it's so useful to kind of hear people's mm. thoughts real time and, and feeding in. Um, I think the the key issues for us at the moment are really around co-production, making sure people work with people with lived experience, whether that's um, one-to-one care through to system and service design, mm-hmm. um, and that being the only way that we can address inequalities, inequalities in terms of and stigma and discrimination. And I mean that not just in terms of like particularly in terms of health inequalities and people from different backgrounds and cultures getting a different access to care than 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 sort of white middle class people mm. but also in terms of people the general population of people living with severe mental illness just not getting the same standard of care as people with mm. more common mental health problems mm. um and there just being so much more that we need to do to kind of listen and talk to people mm. um so uh, at Rethink, we're really keen to help however we can in doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and please yeah, get in touch if you've got any questions. And, and we also have our services as well. So if anyone mm-hmm. who is listening is struggling with mental illness, then we have mm-hmm. our helpline. Um, and, mm-hmm. and please do call that on our website as well. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think for me, when I sort of look at Rethink's work, what stuff that sticks out for me is better together. You know, yeah. there's like so Absolutely. much more to be done. Um, and, you know, this kind of injustice and unsafe unsafe care hurts all of us yeah. and it's mm. something we really do need to come together to change and I guess you know when you're making sort of like a point about kind of a community work and the way that you know the way that people sit inside their own society we can change it society mm. is something you make isn't it and you can make something better but probably yeah. not by so much by yourself <laughs> so mm. I think exactly. If, if you're if you're interested in the work that we think you're doing, please go to the to the website and have a really good nose around and get in contact with Lucy there. So thank you so much for your time tonight, everybody. Thank you. I really enjoyed thank that. It's gone very quickly. So thank you very much, Lucy, for taking time out of your schedule. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.